Matt, we're back at your house today. We're looking at a windrow here. Yep. You know, probably one of the biggest questions I get, I don't know about the biggest questions, but a very frequent question is asking about those little tiny round balers behind a subcompact tractor. Yeah. And yeah, maybe someday we'll get to try one of those, but I've always wondered, will it work with a traditional big square baler? Yep. We saw when we just turned it on here that Johnny was kind of just going back and yep. forth. It'll be interesting if the tail wags the dog. Yep. Um, we think we'll have enough horsepower. What do you guys think? Is this going to work? I'm let's, skeptical. Let's get started. Now, Matt, last year when we did round bales, um, you specifically guided me to go back and forth gently on the windrow so yeah. that we would bale that a uniform bale. a uniform yeah. bale and it yeah. wouldn't be it wouldn't be lopsided do yeah. i have to worry about that with no nope. square bale not at all with this just as long just stay keep the pickup on the windrow and it feeding and that's all you got to do with this the baler is going to do it all it's going to transfer it sideways pack it in cut it to length into the chamber and it's going to do it all itself okay and um, how about speed? Is it is it what I can pull, or what, is it what yeah, feeds gently? Just what? To what how it feeds, just you know, uniform, and uh, the the thinner spots in it, you can go a little faster, and the heavier spots, you just you know, just to where the pickup can handle it, where the baler can handle it. These are fairly large windrows for I put three passes together, and uh, so you know they're fairly large. You, you'll sense you'll be turned around watching that pickup the whole time, and you'll see when it's feeding good or if it's pushing it or whatever, so. Matt, tell me a little bit about this baler. I see it's a 327. Now, I got a couple of guesses first. I see the lettering across the top of it and just the style of that, and that seems to be very similar to what we saw in the big 30 series tractors, like your 4430. Yes. That yeah. lettering, and, and so the era of that would be late 70s, Late right? 70s, but, it, you know, and it could be up into the middle 80s. You know, I don't know when for sure when they started at the 327. It just um, that we'd have to chase some serial numbers to find out. I didn't ask Jack what year it was, so. Yeah, but probably somewhere mid 70s to mid 80s is is the age of, yeah. of, of this baler. Yeah. So it's not a new baler. It's not new technology. No. Nope. Uh, they still make balers similar to this, right? Very so, similar. Uh, it, I, you know, almost identical. So. This is a pretty standard square baler. We used to, when I was a kid, we would see these pulled with a, you know, say an, an M, mm -hmm. uh, Farmall, mm -hmm. or a, a, even a B, mm -hmm. a John Deere. We we would we could see mm -hmm. uh, pull it. So it was not horsepower. Those tractors were a little heavier than Johnny. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing that I'd be concerned about is Johnny just going to be uh, pushed around. Pushed. This yeah. is going to be hard because yeah. there's a flywheel on the back of this or on the side of this, I should say, and. <laughs> And, and that big hammer that going. works a plunger back and forth yeah. and so that's that's It'll the be push. interesting. Yep. Okay. It's not tying it right. This baler hadn't been used for quite some time. The owner had done a fabulous job cleaning it up. It was all well lubricated, totally clean inside, so it had been prepared very well for storage. Even so, some of the components, especially the knotters, are quite finicky. So it's going to take a little while to get them going. Meanwhile, as you can see, it's not doing a good job of tying, so it's just spitting the loose hay back out on the ground. I didn't really ask Matt if he made any adjustments or worked any other magic to get it working, but it seemed like on the second pass here that it was ready to go. You can get a good view of the width of the windrows and just how high it is as well. That's a lot of hay to feed into that baler. Here's a close-up of the knotters. There's a lever here on the left that sets the length of the bale. You'll see it going down slowly as we go forward. Eventually it'll trip and shoot the twine straight up between the hay there, and the knotter will tie it off. That was a fast you could hardly see it. Let's take another look. You'll see the lever trip on the left, and I'll freeze it here so that you can see the string having been forced right up through the bale. And now the knotters make their tie. It happens very quickly. Matt's adjusting these springs to change the weight of the bale. 
This mechanism squeezes the bale before it's tied. Squeezing them harder means the plunger has to push harder or more hay in there. It makes for a much heavier bale. How heavy do you want your bales? Well, it's all personal preference. If I'm going to be lifting them myself, I don't want them too heavy. If somebody else is going to lift them, it's nice to compress the same amount of hay into fewer bales, saving storage space. Now watch under the baler here where the twine goes, and you'll see those forks jam right up through the hay. They push the twine up where it was tied and cut, just like we saw before. Let's take a look at how the front side works. The first thing we have is the pickup. This is a set of stiff wire rotating fingers that lift up the hay and begin the process of feeding it into the baler. The auger then moves the hay toward the right in this picture to where those feeder forks can grab it and force it into the baling compartment. We're not able to see very well into the actual baling compartment where that big plunger is pushing back and forth. And there's good reason for that. If a guy got an arm or a leg stuck between that operating plunger and the hay, well, it'd spoil your entire day. Even though we can't see it, we can get a good feel for what is going on. Those large feed forks you can see from the top are perfectly timed with the plunger. While the plunger is retracted, they push in another wad of hay. The plunger is heavy, and it has that flywheel on the side there that you can see to keep it going. Every time it rams that hay, you can see the bale move backwards just a little bit. That plunging action also has the effect of cutting the hay here on the right side of the bale. So each wad, or flake of hay as it's often called, is totally independent from the others. This makes it easy when feeding. Just grab one or two flakes at a time, and it won't be all intertwined with the rest of the bale. Going back over that first pass again, where the bales were all broken due to the knotter not working. I guess that's the good news. You haven't permanently caused damage if the baler fails to tie. I had to take it really slow here because there was a lot of hay there in a pile. All of the small square balers using this design are offset like this. Actually, that's better for the 1025R because I don't have to drive over the hay. These small tractors don't have very good ground clearance. So driving through the hay is not good. Uh, there's also a risk of getting it wrapped around the drive shaft and yeah, it can cause some problems. Some of the newer small square balers use a direct behind approach. So they follow the tractor directly. My understanding is that these direct behind balers have a, a better overall design, but they're not gonna work very well with a subcompact tractor simply because you'd have to run over that large windrow. I can't say it was an incredibly comfortable ride, not because of the pasture being rough, but more because of the lunging. I think a combination of the tractor being so light and being hydrostatic drive allowed that lunge to, to be more prominent. Well, we answered a question, Matt. Yep. Sure did. We can bale hay with a traditional square baler with a 1025R. Yep. Now, should you all day long? I don't know. I mean, there was times I thought it was putting some strain on it, and, and I don't know if exactly if it was, you know, the clutch on the PTO, mm -hmm. but because of that hammering mm. sound, yeah. I wasn't sure, but I would slow down a little bit and that'd go away. Yeah. Um, I had to go really slow, of course. Mm -hmm. But you had those windrows. Yeah, they were good size I windrows. I think for this size pickup, I think yeah. uh, maybe maybe the windrows were a little bit yeah, too big. Yeah, should have been about half that size. But I think the question that I was trying to answer was, is this a better choice for a 1025R or is one of those mini balers? And I haven't played with a mini baler yet. 
I, the mini bales, I guess they're picking them up still by hand, or are they, they would using have to a fear? Yeah, they're round bales, right? Yeah. They're not going to stack real well, no, I don't think. No, uh, And And with this, you just start in and go, and you know, when everything's right, this baler hadn't been used this year, so everything was a little rusty, so that it took, you know, a little time getting the knotters and everything going right. And, yeah, and then it, it did pretty good. Yeah. I mean, once we got it going, yeah. Um, it seemed like we had maybe one or two busted yeah. bales after that. I mean, yeah. the first the first windrow was all busted, yeah. uh, but I think you kind of got that yeah. result. I know nothing about these knotters. My frustration nada about knotters. Nada. Yeah. Uh, my frustration with the small round bales would be the stopping and the waiting for it to tie, dumping it out and going again. To where this is just a you could just get so much more done in a day. That's that's the whole difference between net wrap and twine tie. A lot of guys go to the net wrap because it's a third of the time it takes to wrap that bale as the twine does. Okay. So, you know, it's just uh, preference in what you got, I guess, or what you want to do. Well, and then so, what your market supports. I mean, if, if yeah. your market supports small squares, that's probably what you need to exactly. be doing. And, and I would say a 1025R can do it. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're dealing on 10 acres here, I think yeah. I think you could do that three times a year. Yep. Uh, yep. That brings up another question. Yep. Is this the third cutting? This is the third, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Looks like you probably won't get a fourth this no, year. No, no. And I didn't cut this super low. I tilted that cutter bar back a little bit so that it's not going into winter or frost, just super short or, you know, peeled off. You can tell, you know, I cut that Tuesday and you can see how much growth, you know, is already coming back. So yeah. it kind of all depending on the weather, um, you know, but um, I would say no to a fourth. Yeah. But, uh, well, if we, uh, if we needed another 100 bales like this, we might try the 2038R on it. I we think could. the only difference we would see um, is uh, maybe a little more weight, and yeah, I wouldn't feel surge. that surge quite as yeah. bad. I really think we were feeding the pickup about as fast as it would take. Yeah. Am, I, am I wrong on yeah, that? No, you're right. It, the size of those windrows, yes, that's that's probably about all that that was going to handle. Okay, so it wasn't like we were no. going extra slow really mm -hmm. because of the tractor. We were no. going about all the yeah. baler wanted to eat. Yeah. Folks, yep. I hope you've enjoyed this. It's always fun to come down and visit Matt. Matt, you have the funnest stuff to do. <laughs> uh, well, I aim to please. So, uh. If you're anywhere near Orleans, Indiana, <laughs> and you need something with green paint on it, talk to Matt at Right Implement. RightImp.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Tractor, Tractor time, time with Tim. Tim. I have to say it looks a little ridiculous. <laughs> I have to say what? It looks a little ridiculous.